That's better? Okay. And uh, I, I may like to move around, so I don't know what I'm going to do. Take it with me? Okay. Do you think that will work? Anyhow, um, man, so many people. What are you all doing here? <laughs> Addicts? What do you mean, addicts? What's an addict? You're powerless over something? I've seen you before. <laughs> Can you imagine a better conference location than this? I mean, do you know the University of Maryland? I did my rounds on a walk, and I went up... Uh, into the information center on the second floor in the college. And of course there was this cute girl behind the information desk. And uh, I had a good excuse to ask her, you know, what, what the history of the college was. And she gave me a little blurb. And uh, after World War II, for the people coming from the service that had to have a job and yet wanted to further their education, this college was founded as an adjunct to the University of Maryland just for that purpose. And can you imagine a better facility? I mean, we've got it practically to ourselves. And uh, anyhow, I'm glad to be here. I come in weakness, and just as I am, um, what you get is less than what you see. <laughs> And um, I'm so glad to be here. And uh, I would just like to take a moment to... Uh, but by the way, I want to say this. Uh, they asked me to be a, a banquet speaker for this convention. And I said, you know what? I just want to be informal. You know, give me some time just to be with the people. And um, one of the reasons for that is... You know, I'm going to, I, I'm not prepared. This is the first time of any talk in SA where I, I'm not prepared. And intentionally, it was the most difficult thing for me to do. I tend to over-prepare. I just wanted to be here with you and with the Spirit of God and, and, and see what comes out. But I thought, as long as I'm here and we've made it through this LAX and the flight here and everything else, uh, I'm going to treat this as though it were my last talk in essay. And I turned 80 last March. There's Delaware back there. Hi. Um, and I was given up for dead at the age of six. My dad died a year earlier and uh, I was hospitalized and almost died, and they gave me up for dead. Uh, someone went to a mountain and prayed, and uh, we found that out later. But um, uh, I wanted to bring someone with me that I wanted to introduce you. Somebody introduced us last night, but I just want to have Iris, my wife, Just say something. How can I say something after that? <laughs> you do very well. You go ahead. <laughs> she said, thank you for coming. <laughs> now, the question is, how can a redhead bombshell in her 30s marry a, a broken, love, crippled, sexaholic, lustaholic, and stick with him for 43 years through the trial of his recovery and, 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 and be all that she was and is. 
She is the best housekeeper. I still don't know how to run the washing machine. And yet this woman is, uh, I guess she gets it from her mother, just a spiritual quietness that is in the home that I need. And our temperaments complement each other. I'm uh, telash. I don't know if anybody knows what that word means, but it's kind of hyper, and she's low, and she's steady. And I just want to say that um, the personal, she has never considered the expenditure of our means or time or energy. She's never even considered it. But it was always came first. Always came first. And I'll never forget the first 3,000 letters from Dear Abby that we got after that uh, 1900 newspapers in 1981. Uh, we, were, we were in the garage, and I would, we'd be getting these letters, and I'd have to say, well, send them this and this, and then we started writing things, and that was actually the, how the white book developed. But um, at one time, she got arthritis in her right thumb to sealing all, she didn't know that this repetitive, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of letters, you know, pressing them, folding the eight and a half by 11 three ways and then putting them in the envelope. And so, and she's an accomplished stained glass artist and watercolor artist. If you ever come to our home, you'll see a, a stained glass studio that is, matches Tiffany. And believe me, uh, and, and here, uh, so, you know, she wound up with a dropout. I've dropped out of everything. There was even a time when I wanted to drop out of SA, and that's a confession. And so to lead with my weakness, I, I, I guess I'll just say that uh, uh, I'm not an administrator, I'm not a strong person, and I don't have any insula I don't seem to have any emotional, spiritual insulation against negative stuff, whether it's from an individual or what's happening in SA or whatnot. And we've gone through tremendous trials. But, um, but he's able. The Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. And uh, we come to you together as the only one who's making this possible. We thank you for the recovery that you are giving us. And we invoke your presence in a very special way and open our hearts that you may guide us today and guide me and make us a blessing to one another and above all, fulfill your love in our fellowship, in our hearts, in our lives, and in our marriage. Um, I guess I'm supposed to say a little bit about the history of SA, and uh, um, then I'd like to talk something about this lust thing that we've been doing this weekend, uh, which is an exceptional first. I think in the previous hour, the recitation of the inventory was really terrific. Do you realize that this program was started in 1935? There were no steps, there were no traditions, there was no name. It was just a group, a, a couple of, a few helpless and hopeless alcoholics. And uh, they discovered they were open as, as last gaspers and desperate people. They were open to the grace of God. But that fellowship was based on some of the principles from the Oxford group, the four absolutes absolute honesty, purity, unselfishness, and love. And I believe what really started them was the absolute honesty. The key to the recovery was absolute honesty. And that's, I see that in our fellowship. And this is what we covet. Um, those original years, there's a pamphlet called Beginnings, the History, Origins, and History, uh, of the early years of SA, which makes kind of interesting reading. I'll never forget, um, I think it was try number three in Hollywood, which turned into failure number three, 
where uh, I opened the meeting after putting an ad in the LA Times, the first time we had a, actually the, the name SA, the big sign outside the Episcopal Church, because the Hollywood Presbyterian Church had kicked us out one block away for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> after two meetings, and then, uh, the th uh, so we start, uh, we, I uh, tried to get it started, and um, um, I'll never forget on the second, uh, by the way, on the first meeting, the only guy present turned out to be the self-proclaimed founder of SCA, Sex Compulsives Anonymous. And uh, that was a weird scene because SCA was getting started, and the way he told it to me was the big reason they were getting started then, uh, and he spoke for himself, uh, to, to, to deal with getting busted because the LA, the LA Vice was beginning to bust the gays. By the way, am I invited to the four o'clock deal for the gays? Oh, yes? Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, that ended in, in dismal failure, but about the second or third meeting, a group of women and men came in from Emotions Anonymous. And they, uh, of course, I had nothing there. All I had was the 12 steps of AA, the big book, nothing. You know, not, nothing. It's just the program of AA. They came in, and um, that was weird because there were bad vibes there. The second time they came in, they said, we're taking over. So they took over the meeting. I'm not a leader. <laughs> and we're going to call it Sexual Health Anonymous, and we're going to rap about our sex problems. That's an exact quote. And then when I heard their stories, that the, that the leader, the, the lady who was the leader, said that she had come there to score. Some of the others of her group had come there to score. And, and, and Roy Kay is just dying inside because he wants lust recovery. He wants recovery. He's got to have his people. And um, uh, what happened to that? Well, that's one of the tremendous experiences. Somebody was asking me yesterday how we got lust into the definition. Well, it's through these failed experiences, time after time, where I was experiencing this education of what I needed and, and wasn't getting it. So there's a long history. And um, finally, I was in the Pacific group, and Clancy was my sponsor for a year. And uh, I had just, Iris had just given me my two-year cake uh, in an AA meeting just for sexaholics. There were just a few of us. And I thought I was home. But anyhow, I went in the Pacific group. And after a year, I had to find another real higher power. So I'd made my sponsor, I'd made my, sponsor my higher power. And so I went to see Chuck C., in Laguna Beach, uh, Clancy's sponsor. And um, that was interesting. Uh, talk about the origins of SA. I just cannot believe it. His first, once I told him my story, my real story, you know, it took about one second, my alcohol story. About one minute, my alcohol story. And then I told him why I was there uh, I've got to find my people, and I've got somebody who wants to be my partner. And he said, there's nothing wrong with sex. I mean, uh, as long as you don't lust. <laughs> and, and, and then something stopped him, and he was speechless. I don't know how many of you ever heard his tapes or anything, but this man is a speaker, he loves to talk, and was the great, you know, missionary of AA. But he stopped and wouldn't, he was silent. And it's like he couldn't speak. And then, suddenly, he started giving me the best of Chuck C., the encouragement. He said, you don't need a partner, because the partner that had told, he was, that we were going to start to say he was going to help me, you know, I didn't have the strength of the administrative knowledge. The one who was going to energize me had opted out 
and I was alone. And I said, and Chuck C. told me, you don't need a sponsor. God is, will be your sponsor. And here, minutes before, he had been poo-pooing the whole idea in a way. And um, I don't know why, really, Sexaholics Anonymous has the first step and the third tradition, the way it is. But I believe, you know, I really can't trace it. I mean, I believe it's providential. The history of the things that were happening in my life and in the life of those first fellowships and those first trials, those first failures. And then when we got together uh, in our garage in, in uh, July of 1991 for the first conference that set the definition as it is. I just believe with all of my heart that uh, it's providential. And I think after 26 years, maybe we're at the beginning of seeing why this happens. Why? When I, got, when I got sober, I wanted to stop Playboy and Penthouse, the arcades, the X-rated movies, the prostitution, all that kind of stuff. And some of that rubbed off on the original people coming in. And even though the literature spoke, and the tradition in the first step was lust first, and sexual sobriety, the primacy was lust, we were all just so thrilled to stop the acting out. So we really can't blame people who have, you know, who are still in that process of learning what we had to learn. That will be with us. And we need to just... Uh, uh, hold to our principles. But I think after 26 years, where are we today? Where's Playboy and Penthouse? I guess they're still being printed, but who needs Playboy and Penthouse when there's a, when there's a, a new spirit of lust in the air that has permeated our whole culture? Forget the internet. That's just a symptom of the new loss, what I call the new loss, that has permeated our whole culture. And whether we uh, resort to porn or not, the new lust is in the air, the spiritual air we breathe. And I believe the new lust has become infected with a spiritual quality, a negative spiritual quality. I call it the spirit of lust. Don't understand it. It's a negative force. I'll never forget my last acting out after a year and a half of sobriety. One month, no, three months, my last sex drunk. I had obtained the services of a prostitute, and for the first time, I said, do you, you know, I, I did like this, do you use uh, drugs? Because I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be pure and clean on this. I'm not going <laughs> to... I'm not going to contribute to somebody's, you know, fatality or whatever. And she shook her head and she said yes. And as she said yes, there was a, a dark smile that came across her face, her countenance. And I entered that darkness spiritually. I just crossed the line, went ahead. And I knew what line I had crossed. Within the next acting out, trying to find a prostitute, I was praying to Satan that I would get to that prostitute first. Well, once I let the dark component of lust, you know, not just something to stimulate the sex thing, once I had become, my soul had been infected and the spirit my, the window of my soul had been opened. Yeah, at the end of that period, that's when I got suicidal. Because I could not get sober again. Get a little drink of water. You all okay? I'm a believer in God 
in this fellowship. I was going to say I'm a believer in SA, but I'm a, I'm a believer that God has called us and is calling us and will be calling us out. Why is it that we have the distinction or the curse of being the only fellowship, the only as fellowship that deals with the primacy of lust today? Why? Why is it that today suddenly the millions, millions of porn hits per hour and I, the last time I checked the internet was 330,000 hits per hour on child porn. You know, I mean, how do they get these statistics? Uh, but we're in a new deal. And so there's a new beginning here. And that's why we need to face this issue of lust. What is lust recovery, but what is lust? So what I'd like to do is uh, take a few minutes. <clears throat> Some of you may have heard this in previous conventions years ago. But I did an inventory on this question. What is lust for me? Once, I, once I've opened that window, not what's the you know, stimulation for a sex act, but, but what is this dark, what is, what's really going on in, a, in one single lust event? And I wrote that down. And what it was, was I was given the gift of playing back an event. This was done in recovery. This was done in sobriety. Several years, several years of current sexual and lust sobriety. Uh, we can only find the true nature of lust and lust recovery in a progressive way. Don't ask me why. Uh, and yet, in, the, in, in any lust temptation... There's no progressive victory. I either drink or I don't. That's the paradox of our program. It's not legal. It's not a legalism. That freedom that we have, which can be the curse, that freedom is the gift of God so that sobriety from lust cannot come from SA, cannot come from me, cannot come from our literature, cannot come from your meetings, cannot come from yourself, regardless of how you tighten those screws on thou shalt not lower the boundary, or raise the boundary, raise the reward, whatever. It comes from God. It comes from the connection and the awakening of putting these principles, incorporating these 12 principles into my life and fellowship and marriage and relations. So what I'm going to do is read <coughs> that inventory. <coughs> Excuse me. And... Um, <coughs> Um, <clears throat> this is heavy stuff. It's spiritual. Uh, <clears throat> for anybody who's been victimized, especially a woman, sexually, pray to God that you won't be affected by this. There's nothing explicit in it at all. It's one lust event. <clears throat> I may comment on it as I go. <clears throat> And I open my heart to my own inventory that you'll never let me ever forget what's in a single lust event in my life, what's really at stake in me, the lustaholic. And bless us with the sight to see ourselves as we really are. It's called the anatomy of a look. There it is over there, that image in the corner of my eye. Light rays impinging on the retina of my peripheral vision, rays coming in, neutral, passive, innocent, brain processing the data as a computer, man, the benign machine. Then, the image moves closer and more data is processed. The computer sets a flag, trigger material, <laughs> recognition. Now, either practicing lust or face a moral pred predicament, decision, to drink or not to drink. Only the lustaholic who's tried recovery can identify with this. Suddenly I'm a spiritual creature with a higher will using the computer. Man, the autonomous being. I'm responsible. I choose to drink, not just look, drink. 
Only the lustaholic knows the difference. What is the drink? Okay, here we go. Instead of light rays coming in passively, registering a neutral image, something is now going out of me. Taking, plundering, against the knowledge and will of that other person. And lightning fast. Doesn't even have to be the hard drool, it can be so gentle. Lust is always an act of violence. The kicker is, who's the violence directed against? What we don't see, it's against the luster. If it happens to be directed to the other person, that's, that's just a, a manifestation. Lust is always an act of violence. Remember that. Every lust event is an act of violence. Rebellion, demand, I want, I must have, I must have or I'll die, so I take and get. It's free and secret. No one knows or ever will know. I don't even acknowledge it to myself. It's the perfect steel. Man knowing good and evil on the same order of being as God. But it's an act against, against the man or woman, yes, but what about a mere picture or fantasy? There's something in me I have to transgress. Something in me I must turn against. The light inside, God, lust proves there's a conscience and the knowledge of good and evil and God. Lust proves the knowledge of good and evil and God. The tree of death is within me. I choose to eat of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brings death into the world and all our woe. It's an act of defiant will against the light I take and shut God out. Isolation, separation, escaping inward, getting lost inside myself, losing myself, but seeming to gain a shot of life. Excuse me. And instead of the image serving oneness with that person, I choose to use it against the natural. Perversion. Greedily I ingest and possess and am possessed. The one glance is enough. I now process the image any way I choose. It's no longer a person or picture out there. It's something in here, a part of me. The image is invested with a supernatural power and presence larger than life, infused with spirit to fill that God emptiness within spiritual intercourse with myself, or is it? Have you ever wondered what that inner spiritual intercourse we're having in lust might really be? We're in that spiritual dimension when we're doing it. We're up against the impossible, aren't we? This creative power I get is from being in the image of God. That's what I use to imbue this thing with its super force. Thus, I pervert the very image of God. But this is what I want and must have. It's taking me out of myself, mood-altering, mind-altering, self-transcending, spiritual ecstasy. What power? I'm in total control. I create and possess. I'm God. The saliva of a false god Juices of voracious appetite, I gulp and devour this inner entity and am devoured. Lust is self-consuming. I'm doing all this to myself. No wonder it unleashes the negative force, rage, and the litany of all of my sins. And what was once neutral, innocent reality, a person, mere picture in the brain, is now a perversion, twisted distortions of reality out of that inner darkness. I, the destroyer at work, I now the god of my own life, creating my own goddess, or god, image, in my own lust image, 
It's false worship. But I have what I truly want, my own God, me. The giver of life to me. To what end? Death. Shutting out the light and love of God and man and woman, blinding me to the truth of myself, for to see that truth would be to fall down and cry, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I challenge every luster who's still deliberately lusting, and I, I'm with you, I understand, I identify with you, I pray with you, for you, that the love of God will be shed in our hearts together. To, to, to really and truly see what's happening in that act of false worship. And most of us are religious people, like I was. The terrible conflict. No wonder we're so messed up. But you know what? I believe the extent of our lust perversion, the extent of our anti-God, anti-human, anti-self lust, the extent of that seems to be an indicator of our lust for God. As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. And the promise of our program, with its emphasis on lust, is the greatest promise of any to find what our lust was really looking for. And that's what we need to come to as a fellowship together. I went through many stages in my lust recovery. I think one of the old ancient essay letters uh, kind of listed them. may be the dark force ringing right now. <laughs> you know what I asked the delegates and trustees yesterday morning at 9 o'clock? I said, how many believe in a higher power? Okay, how many here believe in a higher power? Oh, okay. How many, how many suspect that there's a lower power? Greater is he that is with us than is he out there, the prince of this world. Thank God we're under attack. Thank God we're in any area of our life. We're going to have opposition. And most of it will come from within. It's okay. It's okay. Somebody's looking out for us. And it, it's going to take that for us to find the real promise, what, what our lust was really looking for. And the love, the overpowering love, that's going to be poured out in that awakening as we work these steps together and discover this God together. Uh, let me uh, tell you an experience I had. First of all, I want to get current. I want to lead with my weakness. I can get so wrapped up in lust recovery, I forget what I am. You know, if you've read through those stages of my lust recovery, last time I had written, I think in that essay, what was it, 13 stages? New lust, lust recovery came out in the essay way back. Um, yeah, all, these are neat stages of surrender. Finally, you get to the surrender. Okay, I'm willing not to want to look. And then I, I want to look positively at the woman and give instead. All of these stages of recovery. You know what? They're not consecutive stages. They're just aspects of our recovery that we can have any time of our lives. And they can trip me up on saying, hey, I'm now at level 13. Okay, let me tell you where I'm at today. I thank God the obsession, the addiction, has been lifted to lust. I don't have to lust today. I am free not to lust. And do you know what a miracle that is? Do you know how unbelievably powerful that is? When I came in, you've heard the story. I'm a substitute teacher at Royal High School, at Simi Valley High School, just newly sober, and something's wrong with my head. 
I mean, I'm getting whiplash. I don't even know what I'm doing. Every skirt, whether it's a teacher or, it's, or, or, or the student, and I discovered lust. You know, I was getting sober, so I discovered lust. Anyhow, <clears throat> let's get current. One of the most important things we can do in our meetings is to get with that first absolute. Okay, we're going to be absolute honest. Nobody's length of sobriety counts, the sponsorship, grandfather clause, whatever. None of that counts. <clears throat> and just for this moment, we're going to, under God, don't, not even tell our name. We're just, we're just going to say, okay, where are we with us today? So that'll tell the real story. That'll, that'll tell us real So here I was at uh, the Northridge Mall. My, my barber shop is nearby. I love to go to the Northridge Mall because it's the only place there's a Donatella's Pizza. A Donatella's veggie pizza and a cup of coffee, and I'm just great. I mean, it's just hot off the oven, and, and I'm just doing great. Anyhow, this day, this was only a few weeks ago. Iris hasn't heard this story. <laughs> and it's crowded. It's crowded. School is just out, and I've got my pizza down there. And the only empty table is I'm right here. These are tiny little tables, and about four feet away, is a single mother and three preteens, and she, and and, and I, I can see and she's she's not not the bimbo she's not dressed she doesn't have a trigger on she's not flashing anything she's not what we used to call broadcasting in the ta taxi dancers you know. Taxi dancers used to use the word hey you're broadcasting that's when a man is having an erection while he's paying ten cents a minute to dance with this girl and they hate it. Anyhow, uh, she wasn't broadcasting. I've coined that term for women. Women that light, want to be lusted after, they're really broadcasting. Just like me, if I'm dressed to, to elicit lust, I'm broadcasting. Anyhow, sorry about that. <laughs> How many Essanons are in this room? Oh, hey, hey, great, great, great. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm sitting there and I notice, so, so uh, I notice that's a possible trigger and, uh, and I'm okay. There's no physical attribute that's a lust trigger. You know, she's sitting there, and the kids are well-behaved, and I'm eating and enjoying it. And then I just, you know, she's there, and I glance at her, and I notice, wow, those eyes, large brown eyes, something about them. And it isn't, there's not, not much makeup. And, and, and I turn away. Uh, that might have been the trigger material. And at the time, I wasn't aware that it was. It wasn't anything in the eyes. It was what they meant to me, that they spoke to something deep underneath all this recovery. And so, without knowing it, I was making a decision. I had to do a written inventory. I didn't have to. I did a written inventory of this whole thing and read it to a couple of guys in my accountability circle afterward. But anyhow, during it. So what's happening is I want to look at those eyes. And the trick is there's no lust involved. I'm not lusting after her body. Uh, there's not, you know, I did this, this. So think about what lust is. You know, what is lust? Really? And I'm in delayed adolescence. I'm, I've spent a year in CODA. I'm learning how to relate to women. I'm a sexual male. I'm very sexual, although I don't have sex. And, but I, I enjoy, I, I'm learning how to not be afraid of attractive women. To, it's, a, it's an amazing thing to go through adolescence at the age of, you know, in, in your late 70s. <laughs> And we need to start going through that earlier. <laughs> we need help doing it. You can't, I can't do it just sticking with the guys. I've got to take a risk. That's loaded with danger. I've got to grow up. Part of my recovery is recovering as a human being, a male. And so, man, that year in CODA, 
You know who goes to CODA? Women between affairs, women between marriages, uh, marriages breaking up. They're lovely, attractive, made up, great women. But they're in the 12-step program. They're trying to deal. And so they don't know a sexaholic's in their meeting. And so, you know, I'm having to, I'm having to say, hi, how are you? And talk to him after the meeting. Anyhow, that's another story. That's a year-long history that you need to know about growing up and victory over lust in a form that's not in the typical form. I found myself being victorious over, oh yeah, those legs are there, the high heels are there, the low-cut bust. You know what? Everything's getting lower these days. I mean, you know, they're just going to hang out one of these days and it's going to be okay. They're beautiful. And, and it's okay. But uh, I found the wandering heart. You know what? So insidious. Isn't that an aspect of lust? I discovered it was for me. Victory over the body, over the looks, over the glance. But man, they're kind of neat. <laughs> and um, went through that. So I'm, I'm at the table at the mall and I take a quick look and see nothing she's turned the other way so that was look number two looking back on it that second look what was it the third look I, I looked once more and as I looked the instant just a glance the instant I looked she looked at my eyeball eyeball to eyeball for, you know, a tenth of a second, and I dropped away. That's when it happened. And I left that mall with grief and sorrow. Why? Why? What was I after? It was a take. It was a snatch. I was after something, you know? That poem, that free verse I just read, that was going on then. In a disguised way. A non-sexual, non-lusting. But the attitude of the heart, I was, that glance, and I regret for days until I wrote the inventory and, and gave it to my people. The regret and the sorrow immediately on leaving was this. Here was an attractive woman at her time. I had the feeling going away that she needed to have a male look at her, say, hi, how are the kids? Nice to see you. Is it, it's really crowded, isn't it? And to break that wall of separation, that lust, the anti-God force. And I've been doing that, but I missed it. I didn't do it. And so tremendous regret and shame for not giving to that woman what she needed because she gets the other looks. And I think they're dying. See, they've been programmed from childhood to be the object of male lust and adoration. And here they're dying for a, a mature male to look at them and say, Hi, how are you? crowded in here to give instead of take. Anyhow. Um, you all okay? Okay, the answer to my lust can't be within me. I've proven that in the last 32 years. Here's what happened in about my seventh year of sobriety. Some of you may have heard me tell about this. The central office is in our garage, which almost got burned down in the last fire. Was it two years ago, Iris? I was secretly hoping that it had been burned down and I'd be free of that responsibility. <laughs> 
And maybe God will inspire some essays who have a library experience to catalog the archives and all that stuff in there and, and get it in order. But anyhow, um, this day, I've got a, an armful of little packages and literature and whatnot. I don't think, th well, yeah, there were books then, okay, and letters going to the Chatsworth Post Office. So I go into them, and it's summer. I go into that line, and it's coming out the door. So I get at the back of the line, and guess who's in front of me? Do you know what a see-through dress is? I mean, I mean, have you ever seen? I mean, how many women wear see-through dresses in the summer? Okay, you know what that image is, right? And not only that, but she's tossing her head around, and I just know she's one of us. She's looking for a connection. It's not, you know, anything, anybody. And I just get that feeling, and it's a tremendous temptation. And so I immediately start surrendering. I'm holding these packages. The line is going forward. And okay, uh, you know, I forget what I was. I was doing the, the regular thing. Uh, help me, I'm powerless. Um, bless the woman, whatever, whatever. Coming out, uh, you know, pretty, pretty shaky. <laughs> and uh, it's okay. I've had this kind of lust recovery before, and it's going okay. You know, this isn't the end of the world. It's just another temptation. Then I drop my keys. <clears throat> How many guys know what, what that temptation really is? <laughs> okay. What's in front of me? What's in front of me? And then I just go catatonic. Can't function. Don't know what's happening not even praying, paralyzed. And as the, as the line moves forward, I'm kicking my keys. <laughs> you know. And it's going, I mean, the line is, for, I just keep doing it. Then I just know I'm going to have to pick up those keys. And I knew what I would see, I couldn't handle. I just knew in a flash, you know how your life is supposed to go before you, before death or something? You're off the alpine, you drop in the crevice, and then your whole life goes in front of you. I just, I just knew I couldn't handle it. I was without defense against what would be there. I had no defense against that next drink. At the time came where I had to pick up the keys and a cry, unvoiced cry. That's when I hit my bottom, seven years into current sexual and lust sobriety. That's when I hit my bottom, and the scream of powerlessness and of absolute loss, it just went up. There was an unvoiced scream to heaven. I went down with my eyes open, picked up the keys, and I saw nothing. And in between me and that figure, was the presence of light and joy and glory and freedom. And that's all I can say. From that day on, I started praying, I've got to know who you are for me. And that prayer is being answered. And I don't ever want it to stop. And I think I had to go through the Donatello's pizza thing recently to bring me to where I really am and always have been. I'm a lustaholic. There's something intrinsic Forget the sexual lust, whether it's going to be some form or other. Let's just call it, let's use the deadly three-letter word. Part of the intrinsic sinfulness of my being is apparent. 
and I'm and I and I need. What gives me the freedom today is the knowledge and experience of the one who's saving me. The one who's saving me from my lust. That's the joy of my life today. And that's the promise of the 12 steps. That's the promise that of this, what he's given to us in this impossible aspect of our program. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop lusting and become sexually sober. We admitted we were, first step, we admitted we were powerless over lust. We're the most fortunate people. Now, as we face a time of trial, now, as we've just seen in the previous hour, there are two sobrieties in SA. One that feels we can call ourselves sober and have leadership positions if we are consciously, deliberately, willfully resorting as a practice to porn. Others who are saying, that's, I can't be sober. I, I can't call myself sober. As this infiltrates your group or your area, or the, uh, we see it more and more, and thank God for the honesty of the inventory, this, this is a first, where this, group, this fellowship here has, has, has brought this to the surface without any answers. No answers were given to us. The only answers were where? In the lives of individuals. That's where the answer is going to be. Because God is doing what we can't do. And did you see that, Mike, the, on that, the, the people bearing witness to the truth of this in their lives, on how God is working? This is the merit. This is the joy of our salvation. Um, okay. The answer in our groups, in our inner groups, wherever we're at, the answer lies with the honesty. If you're in a group where there's a compromise, let me tell you something I just did a few weeks ago. There was a man in the Saturday morning group who we knew. I was new to that group, relatively new, so I was just hearing his story week after week. And this particular week, he, he was very clear. He says, well, uh, I... I, I I watch internet porn, but every time before I turn on, I call my internet porn partner, NSA, and I tell him I'm going to watch porn. And when I'm off, I, I call him and tell him when I'm off. And now these two people are in the same. But that's, there's a growing, there's something happening here in SA. Be open to, be open to what it is. And, um, He's been in SA for 16 years and has, uh, 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 I don't think he ever got more than 60 days, but whatever he got was within the same context. And he was just, uh, he, they asked for volunteers for intergroup, and he says, I'll volunteer. He's now an intergroup rep. This is a violation of our 12th tradition, you know, putting personalities before principles. Anyhow, that particular morning, as soon as he shared, the next person to share was a newcomer who was weeping and holding his head in his hands, a big guy. And he, was, and his, he shared the lust. I can't, he, he, was, he was there for the lust. And I could see the contradiction in this meeting. And I've seen it in other meetings. 21-year-old who comes in as a newcomer uh, to get off internet lust and the man leading the meeting, the leading the the the, uh, the newcomers meeting, has has just watched internet porn, and he's taking his 18 month trip because his wife is out of town. Okay, this is the insidious thing that we're up against because lust recovery is so impossible. What I did, I started talking to this man, and and one on one, telling him how I felt, and can I help him in any way? It used to be, 
you know, I would just sit back and resent him. <laughs> I couldn't take it in that meeting. And I, I, I blurted out something about the first tradition uh, and, and, and left. I walked out of that meeting. I took an action. It was the wrong action. Two weeks later, I walked back in and made an amends to, for, made an amends to that group to, for disrupting that group. But at that same time, I talked to the secretary and I said, would you consider putting an agenda item on a business meeting in the future where we can discuss this issue together in the open? Each group is autonomous. So there's something we can do. Something we can do. Okay, I want to close this. What I'm saying is this. Get honest. The honesty of where we are in lust. And let's test God if this program really works for lust recovery. It is working. It is working. And we're the only ones who can let that Spirit of God grow in power so that the critical mass of lust recovery will grow and we won't be. I'm tempted to do something now and I'm just going to go ahead and do it. And I'm going to close with this. But before I close with it, Tomorrow, some of us will probably get together after the convention. And I want to challenge us with 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and seek my face and pray, and stop their wickedness, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. God has called us into the promised land in this area. We're the lucky ones. We're the fortunate ones. Get together with one other person in your group, whatever. Stand. But under God, you've got to have, have, let it be true in your life first. Let it be true in your life first. But here's what I'm going to do. I took a 31-year chip recently. But as I was thinking about this post office experience, you know what came to me? That was such a crucial, beautiful beginning for me. In just beginning to know the one who's keeping me sober, the one who wants to bear my lust, so I don't have to. The one who says, come in, or I can say, come into it. I'm going to reset my sobriety to seven years. I'm 24 years sober, not 32, because that is the most, that meaningful, it has nothing to do with sobriety. The, 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 the discovery I don't want to forget that. I don't ever want to forget that. And I don't want to downplay it. I've got to bear witness to it. And so the new sobriety date is seven years before. And so um, I don't know why. I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs>